<clears throat> okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this book launch. I am. It's my pleasure to uh, to have you here to be your host for uh, the book launch of Le Grand Tour, 1701 à 1703, Lettre de Henry Bentinck et de son précepteur Paul Rapintoara à Hans Willem Bentinck which is a critical edition prepared by Michael Green as the volume 89 of Honoré Champion series Vie des Huguenots. We have a wonderful lineup of speakers for you today. They include Catherine Secretin, Gabor Galeri, Meta Bricadabrom, who would join us in a few minutes, Michael Green himself, and Bertrand Marceau. If you have any questions for the speakers, after their talk, you will have the opportunity to ask them during the discussion period. Please use the raise a hand function on Zoom and I will give you the word, okay? Our first speaker is Catherine Secretin of the Institut des Histoires des Représentations et des Idées dans les Modernités. And she will talk to us about Dutch Huguenots. Please, Catherine, the, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Michael Green for having invited me to take part to this presentation. And I would like also to express my congratulations to him for such an interesting book. Among others, what I found much inspiring in this book is the fact of considering these letters as documents dealing about privacy in the early morning time. I think it's a valuable contribution to new research on content and vocabulary in private matters at that time, and even later. But now let me say a few words about Dutch Protestantism and the relations between the Huguenot and the Dutch Calvinist. When dealing with the Dutch Reformed Church, it is crucial to know that although it was recognized as the privileged church or public kerk, as we would say, it would never been, be recognized as a state church in spite of the repeated and insistent request of the ministers. The Dutch Republic didn't apply the Holy Roman Empire model of cuius regio eius religio, nor the French or English model of the time. This meant that the Dutch Republic was never a confessional state, that the Reformed Church never had the power to impose any religious obedience to the individuals, and that members of other religions, to begin with Catholics and Lutherans, but also dissident movements, such as Remonstrants, Mennonites, and others, remained numerous. The Dutch tolerance mainly comes from that. And this explains that French Huguenots could find twice in their history a refuge in the Netherlands. The arrival of Huguenots refugees in 1685, after the revocation of the Edit de Nantes, was in fact preceded by the Walloon refuge, as it is usually called. This flow of people coming in the late 16th century from the Walloon provinces of South Netherlands were reformed people fleeing persecution from the Spanish authority. The fall of Antwerpen in 1585 only increased this phenomenon. Instead of simply joining the Dutch Reformed Church, these first refugees founded their own communities and their own churches. The Wellen Church was in no way different from the Dutch Reformed Church, except for its liturgy that still used French instead of Dutch. But apart from this, there were no confessional conflict between both churches. There were just separated commun communities and churches. Therefore, nothing could prevent Paul Rapin-Toiras to enter the service of a devout Protestant as Portland. Around mid 17th century, Walloon churches were about 30 throughout the whole Republic, Dutch Republic, and so doing the first refugees built 
a sort of infrastructure that would appear most useful to help and receive the French reformed people who would come later in 1685. It is generally estimated that after the revocation of the Edit de Nantes at the time of the second refuge, the second refuge, there were around 35,000 to arrive in the Dutch Republic, in particular in the cities of the provinces of Holland, Zeeland, and Utrecht. The first Walloon refuge has undoubtedly facilitated the integration of people coming for the same reasons a century after. All the more since a fair number of reformed French ministers were now in 1685 among the refugees, around 600. So a Francophone ecclesiastical structure was quickly set up and able to accommodate the newcomers, but it was not enough. Going into exile heavily depended on social and economic conditions. And this was particularly true in the 80s, as the Dutch Golden Age was on its decline. To leave one's country implied to have information, to have commercial relations in the country of arrival, or a professional activity, such as craftsman, sailor, merchant, publisher, etc that might easily be continued there. This explains why among the thousands of Huguenot refugees who fled from France to North Netherlands, although well welcomed by the Calvinist and sometimes even financially helped by the Dutch civil authorities, many of them remain poor people <clears throat> and had to seek, there's a problem with me, excuse me, you still hear me? Yes. Yes, we hear you fine. Okay, I had something on my screen, I'm sorry. <laughs> so this is explain uh, why among the thousands of Huguenot refugees who fled from France to North Netherlands, although welcomed by the Dutch Calvinists and sometimes even financially helped by the Dutch civil authorities, many remained poor people and had to seek assistance and charity from the Wellen Church. To build a, car a career abroad in such conditions was very difficult. Thus, we may better understand the case of Paul Rapin Toiras, which is in a way emblematic. At first, when he was obliged to flee from France, he found no other solution than to choose for a military career. But then, thanks to his privileged education, having studied, among others, at the famous Academy of Saumur. And thanks to his privileged social origin, he belonged to the French nobility, he was suddenly hired as a tutor in a wealthy Dutch family. A chance, of course, but also a situation that over the years he felt insecure. The letters he wrote to Portland revealed this feeling but particularly the letter 64 of Woodstock to his father, where Woodstock talked about the unbelievable melancholy of Paul Rapin. So from the few information we have as reported by Michael Green, we know that Paul Rapin went back to The Hague after he left the Grand Tour and his pupil. The city was at that time the legal and political center of the country, the seat of the States General of the seven United Provinces and the court, the court of Holland, that is to say the court of justice. It was also the home to many national and international regions and the place of the Prince of Orange court. In 1585, a Wellen church was created, and when in 1591, the widow of William I, the French Louise de Coligny, arrived in the city, she gave a strong impulse to the social and intellectual life of the Wellen community. Someone like André Rivet, the French theologian of Leiden, made a lot to keep close relations between the Wellen Church of Den Haag and the French Reformed Church. 
Thus, I said then Hague. Thus, The Hague was not surprisingly the place where Paul Rapin would return at, and feel at ease, able to devote himself to writing history, even if at last he would retire to Wiesel in Germany, but still close to the Dutch frontier. Thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine. We're going to go directly to the next speaker. And if you have questions, you can save them for the discussion moment in the end of the, of the presentations, okay? Um, the next speaker is Gabor Gelleri from Aberdeen Stuart University, Modern Languages. And he will talk to us about the Grand Tour and early modern travel. Gabor, the floor is yours and you have 10 minutes. Thank you, Natalia. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, yes. excellent. And well, I'm delighted to be here and congratulations to Michael for uh, this lovely volume. So as I was uh, reading the, the volume, I, uh, having worked myself on the practice and the ideologies of the Grand Tour, I started thinking about how it compares to other examples that I know. So first, let's think of this term, the Grand Tour. It sounds so obvious, this term. So yeah, that means a young man of the uh, gentleman of the elite is traveling around Europe. But probably it is actually scholarship that made this term uh, so obvious because it was not actually a term that was actively used at the time we are talking about. At this time, if somebody says Grand Tour, that would mean Grand Tour de France or uh, as a comparison to, for example, the Little Tour of Italy or something like this. So uh, the, this terminology uh, that is never used in France, never used in uh, German when they would rather use Cavaliers Tour uh, or other terms, it is something that became a sort of an umbrella term uh, introduced by scholarship later. It was also less obvious as a practice than it, uh, than it appears sometimes. Not everybody was delighted about the Grand Tour. Uh, not everybody was uh, in favor of sending young men uh, to uh, Grand Tour. There are critical opinions in England. You can think of Joseph Holzkova. This is the most famous example. Uh, the attitudes in France are very ambivalent. Uh, you can think of several of La Fontaine's tales, which uh, cautionary stories about uh, wrong people traveling. The practice is almost unknown in Spain. There is an entire pen of literature that I worked on, uh, Ars Apodemica, which, which attempts to create some sort of optimal practice of the, the Grand Tour. And one of the other Huguenot educators that uh, Michael mentions in the volume, Jean Gaillard, actually wrote an epidemic text in his Complete Gentleman. Uh, as it was highlighted often by scholars of this academic literature, what the relationship between practice and the and theory of travel is, it is very difficult to, to actually catch. So in some way, uh, reading through this correspondence, it is a very usual story. Here's a young man of the future elite and an educator uh, who's very unhappy of his... Uh, young pupil, the educator often uh, is often called in the English terminology, the bear leader, which already the term uh, has this meaning that here is some sort of uncivilized uh, young man, the bear with, that we are trying to, to carry through the established highlights of, of Europe. This is nothing out of the ordinary. This is very much a pattern. Uh, when uh, writing the preface to Travel and Conflict with Rachel Willey, we quoted the case of a um, young uh, gentleman traveling in France, mostly to learn languages at the age of 13. And all we have is the letters of the, his tutor, who is systematically just complaining about the young man uh, all the way uh, to the moment when the young man fell ill and then died tragically. So this, the, the dissatisfied tutor is a trope. Um, the fact that there is a conflict between the tutor and the, uh, the pupil is also quite standard. Michel uh, quoted several uh, other examples. And this is actually why the tutor is there, to try to direct and try to civilize uh, the young man. In the international history of educational travel, there are some interesting uh, uh, practices. For example, in the Transylvanian uh, elites, it was quite standard to send a talented young pupil from the elite schools of the nation to accompany 
an elite aristocratic student. So he would be there to, to provide the good example. So there would be the tutor plus the talented young man plus the uh, young member of the noble elite. And they would travel together trying to instigate some sort of a good behavior and good example. It was also very useful uh, to, to train the future elite of the nation. So there would be a highly educated, well-traveled uh, person available for state uh, roles. But it is also an unusual case. Uh, it's unusual in the fact that both the, the family and the pupil and the educators are the very, very elite. So we are talking about the very top uh, layers from every point of view. Often a foreign tour is a young man's, even an, uh, from a young man and from the nobility, is the only chance to gain uh, valuable skills and experience, the only chance to make themselves some sort of living. There is no such case here. Uh, he has a future ahead of him, possibly not the optimal future, but he would be perfectly fine even without traveling. It is also unusual in the transnational context that Woodstock is at the same time Dutch, but is, he's also English and uh, Rappen himself is sort of between several nations uh, being an exiled Huguenot. Uh, so we are looking at um, a uh, much more complex transnational history of educational travel than we would be looking if uh, it would be just simply a young English gentleman accompanied by his tutor. Also unusual is the fact that what the prime motivation for most cases of Grand Tour, particularly in England, is that is language learning is not a priority here. It, I do not see a particular uh, emphasis on here, particularly uh, when it comes to French. What Woodstock seeks, or rather should seek, is building contacts, uh, which does not work out uh, very well for most of the trip, uh, except maybe the last bit. Finally, I was also quite surprised to look at the, the first plan of the itinerary. So uh, Rappen de Toire built an extensive itinerary, what includes several territories, uh, which belongs to what the great historian of uh, travel, Gilles Bertrand, calls the peripheries of the Grand Tour. Going to Stockholm and uh, to the mines of Hungary, this is not standard itinerary. And I started to count, so from the Netherlands all the way up to Scandinavia and down to Northern Italy and uh, Rappen de Toira counted three months from that. That sounds tremendously optimistic. And also you understand uh, that it was maybe sometimes not the fault of the pupil if the uh, young gentleman on the Grand Tour are accused of just whizzing through the territories without properly studying them. Three months, uh, you simply cannot uh, study uh, so many territories in three months. The young Woodstock seems to be interested in traveling for the sake of curiosity, and I would even call it idle curiosity. He's sort of keen into doing it into sightseeing and enjoyment. His father wants him to expand his contacts and build his future career, and Rappen would like to see him expand his horizon. So what we see here is is the traditional clash of the key notions of early modern academic literature, particularly those developed by uh, Justus Lipsius, who made the, uh, who expressed uh, his opinion about travels in the contrast of utilitas and voluptas. So the, uh, he does, uh, Justus Lipsius does not exclude the idea of voluptas, enjoyment, pleasure from travel, but it should not be the prime motivation as it is in the mind of Woodstock. It should be accompanied by utilitas, the use, the uh, utility. And, and what is the exact use? It's not simply the development of the young man. The development the young, of the young man is a secondary goal. The primary goal is the service of the prince. Even what uh, the individual development of the young man is, is in the service of the prince, because he will be a better servant of his prince, having done the tour of Europe, having gained experience, having built his uh, network, having learned new languages. So with Michael's work, we have here an extraordinarily detailed account of a Grand Tour experience that is quite usual in some aspects and rather unusual in others. Beyond its use for the history of travel and of education, the extensive apparatus that uh, Michael has built around it, including the identification of all individuals that could be identified, 
is exceptionally useful for scholars of early modern networks, uh, of course, also for any question of privacy. Some discussion of the private experiences isn't entirely unusual in grand tour uh, correspondences when we look into, for example, the work of Sarah Goldsmith on masculinity on the grand tour and so on, you can see that uh, it can become quite intimate. But the extent and the complexity we, we find here is uh, quite exceptional. I was particularly interested to see the moment when Rapin de Tomar actually went against his employer's wishes and not letting his pupil to join the army and sort of siding with his pupil with whom he's deeply dissatisfied in all other respects uh, and he cites him and sort of protects him uh, from the, the the wishes of the father so just to conclude this this very idea of suddenly uh, cutting uh, a grand tour experience halfway into it having uh, without uh, really completing what it was created for shows that at the end, maybe the historiography of Grand Tour and generally Grand Tour as a practice was much less straightforward than, than it often appears. And once again, congratulations to Michael for this lovely volume. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gabor. It was a very nice presentation. Uh, we will continue right away to the next, next speaker. And if you have questions, please save them for the end, OK? And uh, our next speaker is Meta birkedal Brum who is the director of the Center for Privacy Studies at the University of Copenhagen. And she will talk to us about early modern privacy. Meta, it's your turn. Thank you so much. And I'm going to share my screen. Um, do you now see my screen in presentation mode? Okay. Yes. So Thank you so much. I'm not going to give a, a grand uh, scholarly expose. I'm mainly here sort of to greet Michael and all of you from Copenhagen and congratulate Michael both with his wonderful book and with his wonderful position. So this is really a festive occasion, Michael, and I'm very uh, honored to have been invited to be part of it. I'm going to say a little bit about the Danish National Research Foundation Center for Privacy Studies and the research that we do there. Michael has been a, a postdoctoral researcher at the center. Um, and I want to say a little bit about notions of early modern privacy by way of our approach at the center. The center was founded in 2017 on a, on a grant from the Danish National Research Foundation and we run until 23. And if we're very good, we'll get four more years after that. The center is dedicated to interdisciplinary research into early modern notions of privacy and the private. So as you probably know, no, it, no definition exists of privacy that pertains to the present. It also pertains to the past. We are not uh, at the center so much interested in reaching a definition as we're interested in going into the semantic field that we see here. So trying to understand privacy and the private in its tension with its opposites. And as you probably know, we, we tend to think of private public as the grand dichotomy, uh, but actually the private is the opposite of a whole lot of different things. And I've tried to map them out here. What we are interested in at the center is to look at the societal factors during which notions of the private and privacy are seen as something threatening. And then the research question becomes threatening to whom and to what perceived values. Uh, and the societal conditions during which uh, privacy is seen as something desirable. And then the question becomes desirable for whom and to what end. That also means that we're not only interested in notions and words uh, pertaining to privacy and the private, but also cognates. I'm going to say a little bit about our approach and I will come to Michael's book, but just to give you a little bit of background first. So also to say that, uh, that notions of privacy, it's really not a simple thing. And I think most of us have this 
tendency to say, well, but there is no such thing as early modern privacy because we all know that every space, all spaces in the early modern period were so cramped and it was just very, very difficult to get some privacy for yourself. What we are interested in at the center is really to tease out some of the ways in which people created pockets of privacy either temporary pockets or more permanent pockets and to see to what to what end did, were these uh, pockets created. And we have two different approaches. One is terminological. We are looking for words that come out of the Latin privatus. So what we call priv words. And the other one is more geared to looking at experiences of privacy. And that's a much more airy concept and how do you uh, how do we avoid anachronism because we come with our modern conception of what is privacy but the hope is that by balancing the terminological and the phenomenological approach we reach some kind of balance also with regard to the danger of anachronism so for the terminological approach we are looking for priv words in any of the languages that we are working in um, and when we find a priv word we are looking at what happens around that priv word in terms of dichotomies and oppositions and what is the the role of that particular passage in that particular text what is the role of that particular text in a given context and what is the historical circumstances and valences uh, invested in that particular text and its context. The other uh, approach, which is probably more interesting uh, in, in regard to, to Michael's work is the phenomenological approach. We are working with what we call the heuristic zones. This is a, a stylized mapping of early modern society, um, which is defined on the basis of a lot of research, both theoretical and historical research on privacy, past and present. We are using these heuristic zones and we fan them out like this because we use them as a research tool. So it's very important for me to say that it's not a model, it's not a theory, it's not a result, it's simply a research tool that helps us work together on the 11 historical cases that we're working on in the Center for Privacy Studies. Um, the, Heuristic zones help us to ask questions about the threshold. So what happens at a given threshold between, say, the wider community, which could be a neighborhood, it could be a social group, between that wider community and a household or a home, what constitutes a threshold? That's, of course, about doors and locks and walls, but it's also about much more airy indicators such as invitations or hierarchies, who can access a given household, what are the conditions that warrant access for a, a particular person that could have to do with, with charity, it could have to do with social regulation, it could have to do with civic control of different kinds. In the same way, what happens when we enter or we hear about historical persons entering into and a chamber or an alcove is that an escalation of privacy who gets to access and so on. But it also helps us to look at overlaps. So what happens when a community gets access into the household, when the, when the boundary around the household is porous rather than robust? What happens say when a state wants to begin to regulate the mindset of its citizens or a tutor the mindset of his pupil, right? Um, so as you know, uh, publications take a long time in our world, but I want to point to this also again to celebrate Michael because that's why we're here today. So this is the first volume that's coming out of the Center for Privacy Studies that Michael has uh, been co-editor of, which will appear with Brill uh, in November. And Michael is not only the editor, but he has also uh, written a very interesting article on the basis of his work with ego documents in early modern Amsterdam. I find uh, your work uh, on, on the Le Grand Tour so interesting in terms of the zones, Michael, and that is not least because the so all these zones can somehow be identified in the letters and in the relationships that, that you are treating in your, in your work. 
But at the same time, this whole travel context makes all these zones even more negotiable and makes them even more sort of ephemeral and portable, as it were. So that actually adds another dimension of porosity on these uh, zones and also makes it even more interesting, at least I think for me, for instance, to see um, how are these zones established in a given context, and and uh, what are what what zones are important to create in terms of sleeping arrangements or in terms of other kinds of of um, accommodation, for instance? And of course, as Gabba also said, um, even more interesting that all of this is happening also with regard to shaping, sort of, in private, in some kind of of respect a particular kind of personhood that is then fit for having an office in public and in society. And I find that tension extremely interesting. So also for that reason, I am really uh, happy about um, your work. And I want to congratulate you once again, both with your amazing volume and also with your amazing new position. Congratulations, Michael. Thank you so much, Meta, for Thank your you, Meta. Uh, contribution. Uh, sorry, I, I, uh, I uh, spoke on top of you, Michal, when you were thanking her. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say thank you, Meta. All right, so let's continue to our next speaker, who actually is Michal himself. And uh, Michal uh, is uh, currently at the University of Woods, and he will be speaking about editing this correspondence. So now it's your turn, Michal. We cannot hear you. Okay, I uh, just want to ask if you see my screen. Great. So I will be brief because we don't have so much time. It's a very difficult hour for people to, uh, to come, but um, well, I'm very glad that you're all here and thank you very much for coming. And uh, it's a big, big occasion for me. Uh, to finally have this book uh, published because I've been working on it actually for about 10 years and uh, it had uh, different stages and uh, I was very glad that uh, in privacy I actually managed to accomplish this book. So thanks once again to Matt and the Danish National Research Foundation for having me there. Um, I will briefly, very briefly speak about the book itself and the outline of the book and this is the plan that uh, Gabor mentioned in his talk. The initial plan of the very ambitious Grand Tour that uh, Paul Arpand Vera planned for his uh, Dutch pupil. And this Grand Tour would go all the way to Stockholm and supposedly all the way south to Messina. That did not happen in reality, but at least that was the ambition. I would like to uh, briefly go through the book itself. So uh, an idea, those of you who have not yet the chance to see it. Uh, the most interesting part for me, besides, of course, the body of letters was the introduction. And the, the, the introduction, of course, deals with the provenance of the letters. And it was quite interesting to see that uh, uh, I actually first discovered copies of the letters. It's only then I realized that the originals still exist. And I saw that there are many less letters in copies than I found originals that triggered the question why. And I will get uh, to that in a moment. But besides that, an historical background of the Grand Tour and the War of Spanish Succession, I uh, gave, as already was mentioned, particular attention to notions of early modern privacy. And those notions actually were the key that I was missing in my introduction to understand why the discrepancy of those letters, why we had less letters in copies uh, than in originals. And uh, that also uh, made me think about what Meta mentioned, the setting in which this grand tour was taking place. So I tried to understand how this uh, young man was living his life during this grand tour. And uh, it was fascinating to see that actually uh, he was supposed to be sharing room with uh, his hosts. And at times he was hiding to try to write a letter to his father and uh, that he was exhausted from all the attention that he was getting, but also complaining about uh, being poorly received at certain courts. All of this was the background of war and uh, bandits on the roads and uh, bad road conditions 
and many, many, many other things that uh, I think make it interesting to read uh, not just my introduction, but also the letters themselves, because they're written in a very clear and uh, rather modern French, I would say. Um, then, of course, I have uh, the body of letters. And uh, what is what was important for me is to try to structureize this correspondence. So I added several appendixes that uh, should help the reader to navigate through this. Um, through this book and through the correspondence itself. So we have tables of letters, not only the letters that were sent in the grand tour and are printed here by the pupil and the tutor, but also additional letters that are found in the archives that relate to the grand tour. For example, some nobles that sent uh, those letters to, uh, to the father, to Hans William Benson, can, to tell him, well, we love your son and it was great to see him. In a way, it was also means to strengthen those connections between uh, the, themselves and uh, the court where Portland was still somehow operating, the court of uh, William III, but also with Portland personally. Um, some of those letters I published. There are many more. I did not want to occupy the entire book with just praise and letters, so there are just five of those letters selected. For those who are interested in travel, I have a list of visited cities in the order of vi visitation. So it's also interesting to see how they actually traveled. Um, Forest of Paintings is a, an educational project that was written for Woodstock as preparation for the trip. And I encountered it during my dissertation work many years ago. And now it became uh, of use. And what was the real discovery is that uh, there are two letters written by Paul uh, Hapant Mehat to then already the, the, the Duke of Portland, uh, his pupil, 20 years after the Grand Tour, which shows that despite all those bad relations that we see in the correspondence, actually they stayed in good uh, connection with each other. And then, of course, a brief summary of uh, Grand Tour letters in English, because actually, initially, this book was supposed to be published in English. And uh, I wrote uh, the introduction in the commentary in English, and it was important for me actually to write it in English, since I wanted to make those French letters accessible to non-French speakers. The publisher decided otherwise, and uh, Bertrand Marceau, who is uh, here uh, somewhere, here you are, <laughs> hello. Uh, he was kind enough uh, to translate uh, my introduction and my footnotes, and I'm very grateful to him for doing, I think, a really excellent job with very difficult uh, terminology also that uh, is in uh, this book sometimes related to privacy, which is not directly translatable into French. So Bertrand was extremely creative in this, and uh, I think he really has done great work, and I, my book benefited from him, that's for sure. I have a few thank you notes, and first uh, is Irene Dingo, where I actually started really working on the book. I was a postdoc. Uh, at uh, the Leibniz Institute for European History uh, in 2014, 15, and 16, twice. Um, so there I had quite a few discussions with her about uh, this correspondence. Then, of course, to Mette Verkadel Brun for having me in Copenhagen, where I had the chance as a side project, it was not my main project uh, at the center, but as a side project to work on the book and uh, uh, also the translation was sponsored by the center, which was a very important thing. I also would like to, to thank uh, Israel Munoz Galarte, who was uh, my supervisor in Cordoba, with whom I had many discussions on the correspondence. And uh, finally, to Anthony McKenna, who is the editor of the Video Guinot you know, series in uh, at uh, Champion. So it was very important for me to have good communication with the editor too. So thanks to him. And there are many more people that uh, I am grateful to, and I hope I have not forgotten anyone, but uh, many of you are present here, and thank you very much for being here. Um, and uh, well, one more special thanks is to my Polson, who is uh, the administrator in privacy, and who was coordinating many of the bureaucratic things related to the publication. Well, I think that I'm running out of time. Natalia, how much time do I still have? Okay, so just briefly to show you the people that were mentioned, uh, Hans William Benson, that's the father of uh, the travel of the pupil uh, who was traveling, and he was close friend of William III, very important noble, 
who at the time of the Grand Tour was already somewhat uh, retiring from public life, but still had quite an important role in the court of William III. Rapant Weha was uh, at the time yet not yet the famous historian who wrote the first uh, comprehensive history of England, but was uh, an aspiring scholar who was uh, living in The Hague and uh, was just newlywed at the time and he constantly complained about being away from home and his wife. And finally, uh, Henry Benting, Viscount Woodstock, who is the pupil, the ben boy, the 19 year old boy who started this Grand Tour and we can actually see how during the Grand Tour he matures. And uh, I did not really write about it in my uh, introduction, but it's something that, you, that one can see when you read the letters that from a boy completely dependent on his father, on his tutor and his father, with a lot of uh, very uh, rather childish interest, you could see how he develops and starts to think big. And uh, that's an important lesson, I think. Just again, very, very briefly about the letters themselves. So the originals uh, are kept at the University of Nottingham and there are 102 of them in uh, total. Majority sent by the pupil. About one uh, third are sent by the tutor. There are no letters from the father to, the father to them. So we only can guess what he was writing based on their replies. That's just an example of a letter of Woodstock and uh, a letter by Rapa. It's written in French. Uh, we have modernized the early modern spelling because that was the demand of the editor. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I think it, it does make it more legible, but in a way it loses a little bit of authenticity. On the other hand, uh, it is still early modern French. So you can get the sense of what it, what it was. And then finally, the copies that uh, brought me to this correspondence, there are only 85 letters. So we have about 20 letters absent from the originals. And it's uh, kept at uh, the British Library, very nice and neatly written volume. Um, so yeah, the privacy concern in omitting those letters is in the introduction. And if you're curious, you should read that. Um, just final note, this is the acquisition records from the British Library of the copies and that were purchased in uh, 1860 something. I don't remember the exact date right now, but uh, that's the acquisition note. And finally, what Woodstock writes about the journey. And uh, this is the question of what was the ground tour for him, at least in the beginning. And uh, he wrote, I've been preparing and looked at this time as time that I could go to foreign courts learn and get to know customs and habits of other countries and enjoy it as a time of pleasure. So study and pleasure all together and don't we all want it? <laughs> Actually, I think students nowadays probably would say more or less the same. So thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Mihail. It was really, really nice uh, um, teaser for your book and I hope everybody here gets to read it. Um, so now if you can stop sharing your screen. Yes, that's great. Thank you so much. Uh, our final speaker is Bertrand Marceau, Bertrand Marceau uh, of the Université, Université de Reims champagne ardenne and he will speak about translating the volume. So Bertrand, the floor is yours now, please. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm very pleased to, to participate in this uh, launch. Uh, I won't be long because I imagine that listeners and readers already have their own uh, ideas about the book and its uh, translation, uh, by the way, and uh, probably they will have some comments or requests. But uh, most of all, I'm very happy to have translated the English part of uh, the considerable work of Michael, uh, Michael. Um, originally, I was working uh, a bit in England, in Kicks College London, and also Skull College in Oxford, and I was uh, um, keen to, to, to go back to uh, an English uh, book to translate uh, into French. My specialty was the study of uh, the church organization in the early modern history. And um, I was used to work on the information flow, uh, the question of the leadership in the European context, uh, the fundings, so the travel, the languages, practices. And so uh, it was quite uh, um, uh, divine surprise uh, to have uh, that book from uh, Michael to, to translate uh, for the part not all of the book because the letter was obviously were uh, originally uh, written in French. 
but uh, Michael did a work uh, very uh, important, the transcription work, obviously the scholarly notes, uh, the historical introduction, the supplements, the bibliography, and so on. And he had, like he said before, conceived this book in English. So this led to um, a particular way of thinking and writing uh, the history for most of the part of the introduction. Um, that was not really a problem. If you are used to, to, to read and to, to write a bit in English, uh, the English of Mihail was uh, uh, absolutely uh, clear. But for some of the part, as uh, Victor Hugo uh, said, uh, uh, le fond, c'est la forme qui remonte à la surface. Uh, we say uh, that he, he said that. Uh, that is to say, in English, uh, the form is probably the substance, the form that comes, uh, that come up to, to, to the surface. And um, that led to some, from time to time, difficulties, uh, not uh, particularly into the syntax, but uh, particularly into uh, the problem of the vocabulary. Uh, well, it was not too complicated to manage because uh, of the current prevalence of the common English in the university uh, fields. But for the eternal question, le tuteur, le précepteur, le professeur, l'enseignant, the preceptor, the tutor, uh, or for the privacy, uh, uh, that we speak about uh, before. Uh, all that question uh, led to um, some very interesting talks and uh, chats with uh, Mihail. Um, fortunately or unfortunately for me, uh, Bentik uh, made a very large trip in Europe. He went not to Sweden, uh, like I said before, but uh, that led to the uh, last point, very particular for the translation, the fact that uh, Michael had to uh, dealt with um, many, many uh, historical contexts, uh, very different. That is to say, the German bibliography, uh, the Italian bibliography, the French bibliography. So my main uh, issue was to gather uh, all that different uh, way of thinking, uh, the uh, footnotes and to do uh, a, a proper work uh, at the one he did in English. And I hope uh, this is uh, at least a bit uh, convenient. And uh, I, win I won't be uh, any, any longer and I wish you a good reading. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bertrand. Uh, thank you so much to all the speakers and to everybody present. And if you have questions, it's, it's now a, a good time for you to pose them. Um, you can just use the um, raise hand function that you can find, I believe, in the participants. Um, and I will give you the, the word. So let me just see, is there anybody who has a question? While we are warming up and people are preparing their questions, I'd like, Michael, maybe uh, to take advantage in, uh, of my uh, privileged position as a moderator and ask you one question. Um, I'd like to know, from, you said you spent almost 10 years working on this project. And after the conclusion of it, after actually seeing it published and, and reaching the hands of the public, what were the biggest challenges and the biggest surprises that you learned from working with this material? Thank you, Natalia. I think that's a very good question. <clears throat> so, yeah, uh, the experience was that uh, you have, every time you read the source, you discover more and more and more. And now I realize that there are so many other things that I could have mentioned and I didn't. And uh, that it's, it probably would have never been conceived. Uh, it would never been accomplished, sorry, if uh, I did not stop at some point. And uh, while working with Bertrand, the translation, we also realized that there are more things that could have been uh, done. But at that point, I said, well, we should just <laughs> stop at that point and not uh, add anything anymore because uh, that would, nev would never be ending. I think uh, what was uh, surprising to me is how many details there are in that in those letters because I read them several times for my dissertation and uh, I used uh, I wrote an article about this correspondence in 2014 uh, on the educational part and that, back then I thought practically that's it 
But when you start uh, editing it and uh, reading into the details, and actually, especially when you start thinking with a different perspective, so this privacy perspective that I gained uh, while being at the Center of Privacy Studies, suddenly it made completely different uh, impression and, and I started understanding those letters differently. So if I read my 2014 article now, I see that uh, I saw completely other things than I have seen it. And uh, for me, that was quite a discovery. And um, I know that uh, some uh, scholars dismiss this kind of uh, documents because they're still, <laughs> even many years after ego documents and uh, uh, for, for Privé are, well, they became accepted. Some still dismiss them as not important and uh, just too subjective. But in fact, that's where the interesting history is. And that can enrich any study when you know those details. And uh, one of the things that struck me is that uh, we all know the war of Spanish succession and there are some books written about it, but some details about the war, the capture of this very famous French general, Villejois, uh, the story that is told by Woodstock, and it's supposed to be first-hand account of the capture, is not the same as the one that has been told in other history books. So this is how we can actually discover completely new things that are not known. I don't know if that was a true story, but at least it's a version that uh, has the, life to, the right to exist. Thank you so much. That's very interesting. And it's interesting to, to see that you uh, looked back at your uh, previous publication with different eyes. That's uh, very enlightening. Meta, now it's your turn. Please ask your question or comment. Well, in a way, I've been cued by you already, uh, Michael, but I wanted to, to, if, to hear whether you could say a little bit more about the relationship between your work on the educational history, history and your work on the eco, eco documents, because we see connections, but at the same time, you've also uh, developed that research in a way in two different strands. So could you say a little bit more about how they, how they throw light on each other? Yes, uh, thank you. That's also a very good question, I would say, and uh, well put. Um, so yes, I mean, my pr primary interest uh, was, when I started doing my dissertation many years ago, was the history of education. And uh, I encountered those letters when I was trying to dig up material to understand how Huguenots were tutoring nobility in early modern Europe. And uh, the best source that I realized that uh, there was was journals, letters, and uh, all kinds of correspondence. And uh, I started by finding the stadtholders letters that you and I and Lars had the chance to work on uh, in another article. And uh, I found that there are a lot of details, not only about the education, but also about private uh, life. And uh, that's how, when I started working on privacy, I realized that I can actually dig out not only educational details, but also details that could shed light on daily life and as consequence also on their notions of uh, privacy. And uh, that was also something that uh, I'm very grateful to you for because it's really uh, changing the way of thinking. So that's how you can enhance your research by getting more than one perspective and uh, traveling through different uh, strands of research from education to private life to privacy, but also to travel writing as, as a genre and to early modern travel as a historical uh, discipline. And uh, I think that that's all together would be not possible if there were no like personal development of me as a scholar and I've made a lot of stops along the way in different places and I gained uh, uh, knowledge and experience from those different places. So I think, I hope that I answered the question. Oh, that's very, very nice to hear too, Michal, because I think that's a, it's, it's an interesting thing to, to, uh, to point out that your experience as you advance in your career also made you look at the sources in a different way. That's a, 
It's a very inspiring thing to hear as a historian. Very cool. Um, I do have a question for Gabor Galeri. Uh, you mentioned something about the itinerary of this Grand Tour not to be very um, common or uh, it, it somehow it struck, struck you as unusual. I'd like to know if you could uh, speak a little bit more about that. What would be a more common itinerary for the Grand Tour or what did you mean by that? Um, thank you. Uh, I mean, most of it is perfectly common uh, due to the immediate uh, political context. They have to get around France. That is unusual because normally their destination uh, would be France, but uh, that is fully understandable in the immediate context of the uh, war of Spanish succession that they do not. Including Scandinavia is very unusual. That uh, I mean, I'm mostly working on French practices, but uh, I not entirely sure uh, how many early 18th century uh, Grand Tour uh, experiences would include Scandinavia. Visiting the mines of Hungary is sort of, can be part of the experience. It depends on the, uh, once again, on the immediate political context. Uh, if he tried to visit it in 1703, that would not work because that's the start of the Rakutsi uprising and simply uh, it would be land of wars in 1701, it would have been possible. The, those mines uh, are well known to, to foreign visitors uh, and they are they were part of the sort of the early modern uh, res mirabilia of these are well known sites to visit with uh, related legends, how some of them turn copper to gold and so on. And Montesquieu will also visit it. Then also unusual is the fact that they are unable to go to southern Italy, uh, also due to immediate political context. So, um, the, yeah, there are many elements of this that that are not usual. I, I wonder whether uh, Rapin de Toara thought about extending what would be the normal uh, itinerary, which would be mostly the southern German states, uh, or sort of southern and middle German states, uh, usually not much further than Berlin. Um, and the entire Italy and so on, uh, because of the political context. So France is closed. So let's do let's do something else. Let's do uh, the territories in Hungary. Let's do Scandinavia. That might be my uh, reaction. But I still find the speed quite excessive. I'm not sure he thought it through exactly. But uh, there are some historians of early modern road networks and so on who could correct me on this. But it it sounds really rather extreme. Can Thank I you so much. That's... Very enlightening. Okay. Yes, Catherine, you have a question? You're muted. Is it okay? Yes, we can hear you. Not very familiar. Uh, I would like to ask Michael, um, do, do we have any information of Woodstock visiting scholars or libraries? Um, because it seems that he only visited uh, uh, friends, uh, relations with his fathers, um, very important politicians and all that, but not anything related to scholarship. Thank you, Catherine. That's actually absolutely true. There is not a single mention of visiting any scholar or doing anything scholarly at all, except of learning Italian and I suppose German because his valet was German. So he would learn some languages. At on occasions, he would visit some churches, and uh, it's usually Rapan who writes back uh, to the father that they visited churches. Woodstock mentioned the only cultural thing: uh, the visit to the opera, and that's it. There is nothing else that uh, he mentions about any scholarly experience. And uh, Rapan writes about this whole uh, educational process of. Uh, uh, of uh, Woodstock, that it has been extremely, she writes in French, interrompu, so sporadic and uh, poorly conceived. And one can only wonder why, because he himself was the one who organized this, this uh, study process, because he has been uh, his head tutor from 1693, uh, when Woodstock uh, was, uh, I think, about uh, 12 or 13 years old. There was another French historian, Michel Levasseur, uh, who was teaching uh, Woodstock history only, but 
there seems that there was some kind of organized process and it's not clear to me why uh, Rapal writes those things, but well. Yeah, that's pretty interesting, but Rapal himself doesn't write anything intellectual either in that, uh, uh, in his uh, letters. They are very long letters sometimes, reflecting on the position of, uh, of Woodstock in the German army if he goes there without uh, having the possibility of a minister. And what's interesting, uh, also without the possibility of having exercise in the, re the religion in public. So it was something that was very important for a to mention, but that's about it. So there is nothing really that uh, could attach Woodstock to anything intellectual whatsoever. Thank you. So if we don't have any other questions, we are also running out of time and it's uh, time to say goodbye. Time to congratulate Michal once more. Now some uh, applause. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for your uh, book, Michael, for this book launch. Thank, Thank you, you for everybody hosting. for being here. And of course, if you want to know more about the book, you can contact Michael. And of course, you can visit the, the link that Michael distributed in the program of this event, uh, which is uh, the Honoré Champion website. Thank you, everybody. It was nice to see you here and I see you next time. Thank you. Thank Goodbye. you. Thank you for coming Thank and thanks for everyone to participate. Thank you. 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 Well, we had uh, 30 people. <laughs>